In this complete beginner's tutorial for portrait photography, I'm going to take you behind the scenes and show you exactly how to create portrait images just like this, where I'll teach you the exact location, camera settings, posing, composition, and lighting techniques required to create professional and dramatic indoor slash natural lighting based portrait images, and all without spending a dime on lighting equipment or expensive studio rentals. These are the exact same techniques that I've personally used to help me grow my Instagram account to over 53,000 followers by helping me consistently create multiple viral portrait images and all using many of the elements that I'm about to teach you. The following footage that you're about to see is sampled from my newly launched Patreon page and represents just a taste of some of the exclusive learning content, behind the scenes footage and raw photo packages I'm giving away on this platform. So with that being said, and without further ado, sit back, relax and enjoy this exclusive complete beginner's guide to portrait photography. Okay, so first and foremost, let's take a look at the final edited photo here as it compares to the original image captured straight out of the camera. And as you can see, we're looking at an ISO of 100. Now, there is a time and place to increase the sensitivity of your ISO beyond 100, in particular for very low light situations or for nighttime shoots. But in this case, it wasn't necessary and any increases above 100, and I would have ran the risk of introducing noise into my image. The lens used was a 50 millimeter Sigma Art lens at f1.4. Now, at such a low f-stop of f1.4, you're gonna be introducing a lot more light into your lens and you're gonna get a nice and blurry background due to a very shallow depth of field, which are both great benefits. But in this case, I decided to shoot at a slightly higher f-stop of f1.6 so as to broaden the depth of field slightly so to decrease the blurriness in the skin and subtly increase the amount of skin texture visible in the raw image. And finally, this image was shot at a shutter speed of one over 200 seconds. Now, of all the configurable camera settings available to you when shooting in manual, shutter speed tends to be my most variable. And for the most part, I use it to control the amount of light coming into the lens. And this will often change depending on where you're shooting and what the lighting conditions are like. Generally speaking, I like to shoot slightly underexposed to create a more dark and moody effect, all the whilst reducing the risk of blowing out the highlights so as to retain as much detail in the skin as possible. So next up, I'm gonna show you some video footage of the location, just to give you a sense where this shot was taken. So let's dive right in here. As you can see, it was shot on a couch. We have this beautiful natural window light coming in. So this is the lighting that was used. We'll talk a little bit more about the lighting technique used. There's actually a lot that goes into it in terms of the lighting direction and the shadow play used and how that enhances depth and dimension. But we'll talk about that more in a second. Let's just quickly run through some of these so you can see a bit of the environment. I thought the bookshelf at the back was very pretty. It has a reflective glass section right over here which I thought was awesome the books had sort of a vintage feel I like the colors and the color and the tones of the background as well are quite dark I do like to shoot in much darker locations in general because it sort of adds to that pop and focus and separation of the subject versus the background itself so I usually am on the lookout for backgrounds that do have more of a darker feel just adds to that moody aesthetic as well and especially helps with that subject separation helping to make our subject pop look more 3d and, and stand out a little bit more so yeah back to it and as you can see i asked francesca to incorporate a couple different poses into the mix here including a book with glasses without uh, Francesca does quite a good job at uh, running through the poses herself. T typically what I ask of someone like Francesca, since she's a little bit more experienced, to feel free to have autonomy as she moves through each of the poses. She's good at, and this is what I'll ask her to do, which is to cycle through some different poses, add subtle changes, add subtle nuances, bring up the hands, look in one direction, look in another, but every time you do, just pause so that I can take some shots, like some, you know, I'd say about three or four shots per different pose, per little nuance, per little change that she makes 
and every now and then I'll say, you know, I'll encourage her, I'll say it's looking great. Maybe just uh, turn your head a little bit to the side. Oh, that's looking great. Let's hold on to that. Let's maintain this. Maybe move the book to the side, but still maintain that direction of where you're looking, that kind of thing. So definitely, you know, don't hesitate to really get involved and give some instruction to your model or the subject that you're working with. Something that can be a helpful guide when it comes to posing is to ask them to think of certain emotions or events in their life that triggered certain emotions. So that's one angle, that's one avenue. Another avenue is to ask them to just maintain a very you know, natural posture, a natural movement as if there wasn't a photographer there. So really that's about it in terms of the context, but we're gonna go deeper now into the actual location and the story behind, you know, where I like to shoot, how I have access to these locations and why I like them. So let's dive into that here. So this is the location where I shot. Now, you have lots of options when it comes to finding similar locations like this. The reason why I like locations like this is because it has a very natural and relaxed setting. It also has a very authentic and realistic side to it. So instead of shooting in a studio, for example, which can look very forced, very fake, very posed, very set up, I like to find natural locations like this, which have a very realistic feel as if the photographer wasn't even there, as if there weren't any studio or expensive lighting used. And actually in this case, no expensive lighting was used. I tried to maintain that natural effect and look as much as possible. So here you can see the couch where we shot. This is where I sat. This is where Francesca sat. And this is the window that was being used as the main key light. And what I did was I would turn off the lights in the room here just so that you don't have so much light coming in from different angles. If you have that, you're gonna have a washed out look. So as you can see here, you have a lot of shadow on this side of Francesca's face. This is super important if you wanna get that three dimensional look, if you wanna have a lot more boosted depth in your image. And so what I'll do is I'll, I'll try and find an, a room or a corner of a room or an area within an apartment like this where there is one key light coming in, whether that's from a bedside lamp, whether that's from a window like this. And I'll use that as my main source of light to illuminate the subject from one angle, from one side of her face, thereby casting shadow on the other side of the face. So now you have this nice fall off here and the transition from shadow to light, which adds that 3D effect, which I just love. Okay, so more on the location itself. This is a friend of mine's Airbnb unit. What I would urge you to do, and I will go deeper into this in another video, is to try and find entrepreneurs who have access to Airbnb units and make the proposition to them that you would like to rent out their space for an hour or two. So just for an hour or two's access, even whilst the cleaners are cleaning in the background, you know, obviously you won't take a shot when the cleaner comes into frame, but a cleaner could be cleaning this area or this area all the whilst using this space over here. You can justify yourself by saying, okay, look, you know, I don't want to take any longer than an hour or two. I'll be in and out. I'll keep it very clean and I'll pay you enough to help cover your expenses for the cleaning service. So you're actually selling yourself in terms of how you can actually benefit the Airbnb unit owner. So that's my usual go-to. Now there are other options that you can use that offer similar locations to this. Another great option is Breather. I'm not sure if you've ever heard of Breather, but Breather is something that's offered all over the world. It's essentially the ability to rent out beautiful spaces, modern workspaces that you can rent out just for an hour or two. And there is a lot of options typically on offer. So I'm in Montreal, Canada, and you can just see by the listing here all of the different options that are at your disposal. So a lot of these spaces are workspace oriented, but they do have areas like 
this over here that would work perfectly as it looks like any kind of living room or hotel lobby just adds that luxurious authentic feel that you don't get from a rented studio. In addition to breather, there is also the ability to use your own house, your own apartment. I mean, if you're shooting with a 50 millimeter at a low f-stop of f1.4, then it doesn't really matter where you are so long as there's a clean and beautiful color because the background's gonna be so blurred. So either your own apartment, you can ask your friend to have access to their living room, your an another friend's apartment. Really, there are, are so many options, but what I would urge you to do to get the look and feel of a lot of my photos is to find natural looking spaces so the so that you don't have that fake studio look and feel it just adds to the magic that this is something that wasn't set up and it was just an actual situation that was captured so as you can see here this was another airbnb unit from another friend and we'll dive into as being part of my patreon feed we're gonna dive into all of these photos the behind the scenes i'm gonna cover everything up from all the different lighting techniques the location how i got access to these locations etc etc i'm gonna leave nothing out so don't worry so yeah let's go back to this photo now now we let's cover something that's very important and that is the lighting so i've already touched on it briefly you want it to be soft light so you don't want to be outside and have the sun directly hitting your model that would create very sharp or rigid edge shadows on your subject face for example you would see the nose outline very perfectly here if the light is a small light source like a candle or the sun in the distance you know it's very pinpoint it creates very sharp edged shadows so using a window is a perfect way to achieve this very soft lighting effect because the window itself acts like a professional softbox because it's very wide it's very big if you, especially if you bring your subject close to the window that like you can see here you can see that you have this big softbox shining on your subject and that's what creates that very soft effect which is just beautiful it's very flattering it helps to iron out a lot of your subject's small bumps and wrinkles also any blemishes become diminished soft lighting is really the go-to and it's something i use in a lot of my photos next up let's talk about the actual lighting direction that was used this is another whole world that we can dive into and I will at length break down all the different lighting direction techniques cinematic lighting direction te techniques that you can use in your portrait photography but for now let's talk about the one used here which is Rembrandt lighting so Rembrandt lighting is let me show you the best one to illustrate he is a painter that would use this iconic type of lighting direction whereby you have the main key light, the main source of light hitting his subject, typically a window, as you can see right here. See, even Rembrandt was using a window because it created that beautiful soft light. No expensive studio equipment was used for Rembrandt, not only because he could not access uh, have access to this technology in his day, but it just goes to show how simple and affordable it can be to achieve beautiful results like this. And what's iconic about Rembrandt's lighting is that he will often have this small patch of light on this side, on the shadowy side of his subject's face. So let's take a look at another example of that. So you can see, so these are examples of Rembrandt lighting when you have this small triangular patch on the one side of your subject's face. So that means that the light is coming in from the left or right side of your subject. So this is Rembrandt lighting and it is a type of lighting that I love to use in a lot of my work, which I'll show you on my feed now. So here you can see another small triangular patch of light so let's take a look at my feed and you can see some other great examples of this so here you have a little bit of the rembrandt light coming in here too you have the patch of light coming in here you have the shadowy fall off under the cheeks under the chin you have the the shadow on the one side of your subject's face but you do have this triangular patch of light which is iconic of rembrandt lighting so here you have it again here you have it again, 
So this is one of the cinematic lighting techniques that I use in other exclusive behind the scenes and making of videos. I will dive into each and every single one of the cinematic lighting techniques that I use, but we're gonna be focusing in on this photo today. So you wanna position your subject so that you have the light coming in from one side, not behind your subject so that it just hits the side of your subject's face. You want it to be a little bit crossing over to the front in front of your subject here so that you have a little bit more spilling onto your subject's cheek. As you can see right here, we have some light spilling over here. So that's Rembrandt lighting. It adds that very three-dimensional look and feel because you have the highlights hitting over here and then you have the fall off from light highlight into shadow, which adds that very three-dimensional effect. Okay, so that's the lighting. Now let's talk about the gear use. So this is my camera. In my course, I have a ton of information and additional documentation about alternatives to the Sony a7R II, but really it comes down to that dynamic range. That's what sold it for me. And if you do a quick Google search, I'm sure you'll find lots of other cameras that are much more inexpensive that still offer a high dynamic range. So that's the camera I use. This is the lens that I use. I absolutely love the Sigma 50 millimeter f1.4 art lens. Sigma are absolutely killing it right now. The results that they are achieving are absolutely incredible. And for the price, it's just unbelievable. Canon offers a similar line, a special line that offer results like this but they will be upwards of you know, $1,500 to $2,000. So this is really a steal when you think about the type of results that you can get with this lens. The 50 millimeter is a fantastic lens for portraiture, would highly recommend. There are tons of cheaper alternatives. They call it the Nifty 50 or the Thrifty 50 because you can get some really high quality 50 millimeter lenses that are quite inexpensive. I mean, even a third of this price. So I would definitely look into that, definitely recommend a 50 millimeter for your portrait photography and you want to get something that has a low f-stop like this f1.4 up to f2 because this creates a very shallow depth of field a very blurry background you get that beautiful subject separation between the sharp in focus area of your subject's facial features their eyes in particular falling off into the more gradual blurriness of the surrounding area either closer to you as the photographer or further away from you and the model into the background so a 50 millimeter and a low f-stop those are two main takeaways of the lens that I used and what I would recommend you use to achieve similar results. But that's it for this photo, guys. I will be including the raw photo for this image in this post. I would love to see you take a crack at its edit. When it comes to the actual edit of this photo, if you are in my tier three for Patreon, I will be editing this photo in a live stream to give you a breakdown of what went into this edit. But for now, you have access to the raw photo. If you have access to my course, you know the exact techniques and methods that go into this type of edit. So feel free to take a crack at it. I would love to see your work. Feel free to tag me, message me, share the work with me. I would love to feature it on my Instagram story. I'd be very happy to. So really, that's it, guys. I hope you found that helpful, and I look forward to seeing you in the next video. Take care for now.